People just love to collect stuff. But let me tell you something about serious collectors. Serious collectors don't like junk. Serious collectors aren't going to sell you a hundred dollar item for ten bucks. Serious collectors don't pawn their treasures. Serious collectors exist everywhere. Collecting Seriously, a show dedicated to real collecting. Without the buying, selling, or haggling. Educational, interesting, and entertaining. Seriously. Thousands of CDs, LPs, and 45s, and I've got one 78. This is going to be a short listening experience. My name is Jimmy Sparks. I wanted to create a show that showcases collections and collectors. Expert mega collector Doug Smith and I have no trouble finding incredible collections in every category you can think of, and in any neighborhood in any city. No selling, no buying, no haggling. We're not interested, and they're not either. We are all about the stuff. It's collecting. Seriously. Throughout collecting seriously, you may see this logo. A fool. We think a good way to check out somebody's collection without feeling overwhelmed is to, in your own mind, categorize what it is you're actually seeing. Most collections may consist of bulk, the mass or size of it all, fun items, the pieces that people are naturally drawn to, unique items, the rare, limited, one-of-a-kinds, and usually the most valuable pieces, and the ace in the hole, which is anything the collector has pride owning. It can be the best, the first, the favorite, or even something they don't have yet. Not all collections have these traits, but following these four guidelines might help you not to get lost. Hey, Jimmy, what you doing? Playing some records? Record? Where'd you get the old phonograph? Oh, this was somebody's pride and joy at one time. It got passed on to me because my siblings know how much of a music expert I am. So here I am, and looking for the headphone jack. Any idea where that might be? Jimmy, this thing's out of the 30s or the 40s. They didn't have headphone jacks on these things. Heck, it's not even electric. And here I was going to download this old 78 out of this flash drive. So now you're going to tell me that there's no USB port? Um... <laughs> I'm only kidding. I know it doesn't have a USB port on it. But it's not working right anyway. It's dragging. It has a little distortion in there, I think. I'm not sure what to do about it. Oh, well, it might just need a new spring. I think we can address that pretty easily. Mm, cool. In fact, I've got one of mine in the shop right now. Why don't we go out and see how John's coming along with it? Yeah, sounds great. Hey, John. What you working on? Hiya, Doug. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. I'm glad you came by. I want to show you what I just did. This uh, Edison phonograph came to me real dirty and all the gears were stuck and everything, so I had to lubricate it real well and finally got it to turn around like it's supposed to. And, uh, but I see I'm going to have a different problem. This is the reproducer, mm -hmm. the sound reproducer, and uh, it's going to have to have uh, a little work done on it. This part in here, the hole, holds the stylus, the diamond stylus actually. I don't know, can you see that? Oh yeah. It's uh, and it it requires a real small diamond point that goes in here. We also have to replace the diaphragm in there and the gaskets, which will eventually go in there too, because over the years they get old and uh, stiff and they break. So that's going to be our the main focus here in just a little bit. Would you like to see your phonograph that I just finished? Yeah, that's why I'm here. Okay. Yeah, let's do that. What I had to do is work on this reproducer part. This is the, uh, the heart of the unit, besides the motor, because without this you can't uh, reproduce the sound. The uh, stylus had to be replaced. Now that's a sapphire stylus. Once it, you put a new sapphire in there, it should last uh, another generation. The other thing that I had to do, Doug, was uh, your belt was slipping, so I had to replace the belt. Mm -hmm. And uh, the speed was not set correctly, so 
After a few little adjustments, I got the speed right. These are my cylinders, but uh, they weren't playing right. The reason was, Doug, that uh, they didn't fit properly on the the silvery part called a mandrel. When you slip the record on, before I got to them, they would only slip partially into the mandrel. So what I had to do is uh, take this uh, part in here and ream it out. And for that I have a, a special tool here called a reamer. So we stick that in there and rotate it, which uh, grinds away at the plaster of Paris that's inside. And I have a mark here. That's how far I should go. And uh, it should go in right up to the edge. And we close the gate, make sure it's locked. Rotate it toward you. And you're gonna put the horn on. Okay, do I need to crank it? Give it a few turns. Okay. Doug. That should be sufficient. That feels good. Then you can turn it on. You ready? Ready. Well, here are a couple of phonographs, uh, Doug, that uh, helped me get started. This particular one is an Edison standard cylinder phonograph, very similar to the one that you've seen. But this has got a little variation to it. Over here I have a, a Columbia disc graphophone. When I was a kid growing up, we called them a record player. And my father called his a hi-fi, and my grandma referred to hers as a Victrola. Where do these names come from? And I even from? had a quadraphonic. <laughs> so, right. But uh, the, the term phonograph was typically used by the Edison machine, by the Edison company, and uh, the other companies that produced phonographs, they picked up on that term, phonographs, but they also call them graphophones, and gramophones, gramophones, and uh, record players, and talking machines. So they're all synonymous. Okay. You asked me how did I get started in this uh, business hobby. Mm -hmm. Well, I attribute that to my father-in-law. He, in the early days after my wife and I got married, he took us out to antique shops all over these tri-states, Illinois, Iowa, and Wisconsin. And there were lots of antique shops back in those days, and almost every one of them had some phonograph parts and so on. Now, he was the collector back in those days, and I was just a tag-along. Mm -hmm. And so when I saw him bringing and collecting all these nice items here, I got a little curious. I said, well, maybe I should start doing some of that too. And uh, so when I beat him to an item, I bought it. When he beat me to an item, he bought it. And we both acquired collections that way. Not only did I have parts now and phonographs that sometimes didn't work, I had to learn how to work them, how to, how to make them operate again properly. And so with his skill, his knowledge about phonographs, he taught me a lot of skills about uh, the restoration of phonographs. So where are you taking me now? Well, Doug, I want to show you some phonographs that I've recently restored and uh, they're nice enough to display. So I'm going to show you uh, my little showroom. Excellent. You might consider it a showroom, but it's actually uh, a lot of the phonographs that I've worked on and once they're ready, they get displayed over here and if anybody wants to take a look at them, they're welcome to. So this room is filled with phonographs that you've picked up along the way somewhere and have restored and now are selling. The phonographs uh, that I've picked up at yard sales or farm auctions or maybe even at larger auctions that have mostly just phonographs for sale there. But uh, they all wind up over here after I've restored them. And uh, as I'm not a collector, I don't keep them. I offer them up for sale. And I do have a website, phonographs.org, in case you're interested. I'm always drawn to the horns, especially the ones that are hand-painted with the flowers. They're so beautiful. The more flowery they are, the more expensive they are. People had to buy them as uh, accessories to the phonographs that they wanted to purchase. Some of the phonographs already had the large horns on them, so they were not for, for those kinds of phonographs. But remember your own phonograph downstairs? Mm -hmm. Now that had a short horn. Now if you wanted a more volume and you had the little clip in front, you would required a rod and that foot and uh, one of these big horns would fit right on there. 
and uh, you could play your phonograph with one of these larger horns. So who typically brings you a machine to repair? Are these big collectors uh, that have hundreds of machines or uh, somebody that just has one that maybe they have had for years that, that doesn't work anymore? You know, sometimes people just walk in with a phonograph and say, I hear that you repair phonographs. That happens quite frequently, but most of my work is comes through the mail. People from all over the world mail me repair work. They could be collectors, they could be just a, a family that has one or has a phonograph that's been in their family for all these years and they need to have it working again or they'd love to have it working again. After doing a little bit of advertising in my early years, uh, an elderly couple, they called me and said they have a phonograph up in their attic uh, and it doesn't work, they'd like to get rid of it because it doesn't work. So I went over there and took a look at their phonograph and uh, happened to have my screwdriver with me and uh, did a little bit here, a little bit there and pretty soon the turntable started rotating and uh, I put the reproducer on the record that was there and I looked at them and uh, they recalled the old times when they were married, this was their wedding present to themselves and uh, it's working now, we can't sell it and I don't want to buy it from them either. I'm just so thrilled to get it working again for them. They now have it in their living room, enjoying it again. That's the pleasure that I get from it. Hey, All right, we'll Take see you later. See you. Yeah, bye-bye. You know, John's not really a collector, but for guys like me, he's indispensable. You know, I think John will have your phonograph ready in no time. Yeah, he's really good at what he does, and it'll be nice to have that uh, in good working order again. But you know, 78s, you just can't buy them anymore. They stopped making them around 1958? Well, actually, I've got them up through 1960. Uh, a lot of your early rock and roll is available on 78, but they're all pretty hard to find. Yeah, all I ever find are big band like uh, Frank Sinatra, Perry Como, all those old popular artists. Sure, Glenn Miller. But when you think about it, rock and roll only had about a five-year period there and the 78 was gone. 